In this part two, I'll talk about a particular case of forgery, one that I've avoided showing or talking about, except for glancing allusions, throughout the series, but I now feel it's time to go public with. This is the case of the would-be early masterwork titled Riverbank, a promised loan to the Metropolitan Museum of Art from my colleague Wen Fong's brother-in-law, Oscar Tang, or Tang, I'm not sure how he pronounced it. It's part of a group of paintings promised to the Met, most of them fine and original paintings. Oscar Tang is definitely, in my book, a good guy. I was present at the big celebratory dinner for this promised gift, wearing my tuxedo, sitting at the head table with Oscar Tang, Wen Fong, and others. Uh, next, please. And not mentioning my doubts about Riverbank during the whole evening. I'd promised Mike Hearn that I wouldn't do that. But my belief about the painting, which had been expressed earlier in a lecture with Wen Fong, in the, actually with Wen Fong in the audience, uh, as I related my fair metal talk, my belief about that painting became known, and a big controversy ensued. I'm sorry that Oscar Tang is involved in this. He's a fine collector and a major philanthropist. I showed and praised one of his paintings earlier, the Yuan Zhang painting in Lecture 5, and also the Tang style painting of a palace with ladies, same lecture, which is part of the promised gift. Nick, please. I'm sorry also to even seem to be questioning the connoisseurship of C.C. Wong, whom I presented near the beginning of this lecture series as one of my three great teachers and a good friend over many years. I was sorry that this affair hurt our friendship during his last years. When I would visit him, he would have this painting hanging on the wall and would ask me plaintively why I thought it wasn't an old masterpiece. And of course, it was impossible to explain why to him with this dark thing hanging on the wall, short of sitting him down and giving him a slideshow similar to the one I'm doing now, I could never have shown him why I didn't believe in it. Uh, next, please. I've mentioned several times in this series the realization I've come to late in my life that the Chinese tradition, traditional practice of connoisseurship, which is very effective for all the later periods, Yuan and after, when their criteria of individual style and the artist's hand can be applied, doesn't work so well for the Song and earlier, when those criteria typically can't be used. Zhang Chen knew about this Chinese weakness, and he exploited it in his fakes, planting in them the indicators of early style he knew they wanted. C.C. Wang also recognized this problem on some level, and he would ask me for my opinion before purchasing works of the early period. For instance, the hand scroll titled Summer Mountains, now on the screen, which he was considering, and which he looked at with me in Hong Kong. I could tell him with some accuracy what curators and others in the U.S. were going to think about the painting. Next. And C.C. had purchased at auction shortly before the Issues and Authenticity Symposium what I believe to be another Zhang Da Chen fake, a hand scroll titled Wind on the River, loosely attributed to Yen Lun Gui, which had previously been owned by the eccentric Chicago collector Stephen Junkins. Because Junkins had kept it secret, never allowing it to be published or exhibited, it had acquired a kind of legendary status, and Wang paid a big price for it. It bears seals, forged of course, of Liang Qingbiao and the Chenlong Emperor. Next. What Zhang Da Chen the forger is thinking of in making this forgery is the hand scroll we've seen in Lecture 7, the painting in the Osaka Municipal Museum, which is either a genuine work of Yen Wen Gui or the work of a close follower. In either case, it's an old and fine painting. It begins with a passage of windswept river with trees, and Zhang's forgery follows that. Next, please. But where the genuinely old painting presents believable mountain forms and spaces, all visually penetrable and readable in three dimensions, next. Zhang's fake scroll presents mountain forms that have no real sense of mass or structure, and no real spaces between them. It's all faked. Zhang counts on the darkness of the silk and the look of great age to keep viewers from recognizing the real weakness of his painting. His mountain masses have no depth. They are only flat patterns of repeated parallel contours. Well, I hope that this example will help to reveal some of the real weaknesses of Zhang Da Chen's forgeries which can be recognized when they are looked at with critical eyes. One of the basic truths recognized by art historians 
is that the 20th century artist cannot really paint in the style of a 10th century artist. He'll always give himself away somehow, even if he can fool some people for a while. Next, please. <coughs> Another section of the forgery in a detail. Throughout it, Zhang has drawn in buildings and tried to connect them with roads, but he hasn't the ability that an early artist had to conceive and execute these convincingly. He can only fake them. Now I want to show a few others of Zhang's fakes to expand on this observation about his weakness and how we can recognize his forgeries, especially if we can compare them with the original paintings he based them on. Next. Among the many paintings I saw in Kyoto during my Fulbright year there, as Shimada took me around to visit collectors and view their holdings, was this anonymous picture of a sleeping gibbon on an earth bank, loosely attributed to Mu Chi, but really just a late Song anonymous work. It was owned by a Mr. Noda and had been published in Kokka magazine. An accompanying painting had a Mu Chi seal on it. Zhang Da Chen must have seen this picture in Kokka and used it as a basis for two of his forgeries. Next, please. <coughs> he copied it twice, that is, and he added to his copies fake signatures of Liang Kai, haha, <laughs> and sold them, sold one of them to the Honolulu Art Academy while Gustav Eco was there. I had the sad job of telling Gustav, who was a good friend, that I thought he had bought a fake. I still have the correspondence with him. He wanted to see the painting in Kokka as a copy after his Liang Kai. But here, too, the wrongness of Zhang's fake becomes apparent as one looks at it longer, the way the gibbon's body doesn't really recede properly as it does in the original, the rough and showy brushwork of the bank, quite impossible for Liang Kai. Next, please. Another of the paintings Zhang copied as a forgery was this imaginary portrait of the early statesman Zhuge Liang by the late Ming early Qing master Zhang Feng. I have a whole lecture devoted to this painting on my website as CLP 83. I knew at first from the reproduction in an old reproduction book dedicated to paintings owned by the famous collector named Hu Guanwu, whose studio name was Tianxi Shu Wu. Tianxi Shu Wu meaning field and stream studio. I had met him and seen some of his collection when I stopped in Hong Kong on my way back from my Fulbright year in Japan in 1955. Then more recently, the painting, this original painting that is, turned up in an auction, minus the seals in lower right, which had for some reason been removed. Collectors will sometimes take off their seals when they sell a painting to avoid the embarrassment of having had to part with it. <coughs> Next, please. Here is a detail of the painting. I used to show it in classes as a particularly fine and important work of figure painting from the late period in China. The drawing is supple and effective, bringing out the volume of the body under the robe. Look especially at how it goes over the shoulder and around his back. The man's face is lifted slightly, his beard projecting strongly, giving him an air of quiet determination suitable to the subject, of course. Next, please. And I would show beside it one of the two Zhang Da Chen copies of this painting, the one that is in a Japanese private collection and was regularly shown at the Tokyo National Museum as a genuine work of, of Zhang Feng and was reproduced in Yoshiho Yonezawa's book on Ming painting. The differences are obvious. Zhang turns it into a kind of self-portrait with the face more de defiantly lifted and as if grimacing. All the suppleness of drawing in the robe is lost replaced by a more vigorous but much less form-defining drawing. It goes badly wrong in the base, just left of the center, where he repeats the stroke several times. Here, too, Zhang can't resist turning his brush loose instead of keeping it properly disciplined, as the earlier artist could do. That this fake has escaped detection for so long is strange. <coughs> Once when I was having dinner with Zhang Da Chen in D.C., after one of his visits to the Freer, I decided to try to pin him down by asking him about the three versions of this painting that I knew of, two of them with his seals on them. Which of these, I asked him, is the real one? His reply was, Zhang Feng really loved this subject, and he painted it several times. They are all genuine. <laughs> you could not pin Zhang Da Chen down. Okay, next, please. Now back to Riverbank. I put an image of it made from a black-and-white photo which shows its composition more clearly beside... Uh, Zhang self-portrait done when he was 60, around the time he made this great forgery, or maybe a little bit later. Riverbank should be no less visually detectable 
as what it is than his forgery of the Yen Gui scroll, or the Liang Kai gibbon or the Zhang Feng figure. It's just as full of stylistic mistakes and passages impossible for early painting. And as I remarked in the addendum to my Freer Medal lecture, the reluctance of so many of the specialists in our field to recognize this says something disturbing about our field. Uh, I don't mean to pursue that matter, however. Instead, I'll present some of the visual evidence for, it, for uh, Riverbanks being what it is, a Zhang Dachin forgery. Next, please. Those of you who followed these lectures and remember what 10th century landscapes looked like should be able to reject Riverbank as one of them immediately. I put beside it as one example out of several, if it were possible, uh, the work ascribed to Guangtong, Travelers in the Mountains. Here, mist hides the earth forms in only a few limited areas. The brush drawing is strong and consistent throughout, and the whole is spatially readable. In Riverbank, by contrast, the top of the highest peak at left simply disappears as if into mist, and the spatial scheme is chaotic, unreadable. A river winds toward us from the far distance, but stops at a midpoint and seems to turn into a path that winds down with people walking on it. Next, please. Similarly, with this hand scroll landscape attributed to Dungyuan, which is probably an early copy after one of his works, areas of mist here are limited to small patches that obscure the tops of the hills. Nowhere in early painting does the entire top of a landscape form disappear into mist. Next, please. But in a well-recognized Zhang Da Chen forgery, by contrast, this fake Juron, formerly owned by the Hong Kong collector Chen Rentao, the mountaintop is similarly obscured or hidden by fog. It's easy to parallel in this way the anomalous features in Riverbank in other Zhang, Zhang Da Chen forgeries. Instead of going on doing that, however, let me show instead how the whole composition of Riverbank and various elements of its composition can be paralleled closely in acknowledged signed landscape paintings done by Zhang Da Chen in the late 1940s and early 50s, the period when he also did Riverbank. Next, please. In this one, for instance, which he painted in 1949, the movement from far distance into the foreground, starting with the winding river, broken midway by a horizontal bank with the building, and continuing below as a winding path into the foreground, is closely similar, as is the hollow with the waterfall, the foreground building with figures and other features. The parallel is really very close, and no such close parallel could be made with any genuinely early painting. Next, please. Or this one. The similarities are so obvious I needn't point them out. Zhang in this period was doing numerous landscapes inscribed as in the manner of Dungyuan, or after Dungyuan. He was developing his expertise in recreating the supposed style of that great and mysterious early master, whose works all serious collectors want to own and are frustrated over not being able to acquire because none of his work survive, a situation Zhang Da Chen worked to remedy. Next, please. This is the one that my former student sent me in a slide as one of the signed works that she and her students had used in determining independently that Riverbank was a Zhang Da Chen forgery. Again, the river comes from far distance down to a point where a horizontal bank with buildings breaks it, and the movement continues below as a path or a road into the foreground. The foreground tree group and other features are obviously similar. Next, please. Now here is the upper part of Riverbank in a contrasty black and white photo. I don't have really good slides of Riverbank. I never really had a chance to make them. I could have back when it was owned by C.Z. Wong. But anyway, I have to use slides made from photos and reproductions. I'm sorry. Anyway, here is the upper part of Riverbank, as I say, in a rather contrasty black and white photo to show the highly distinctive structure of the main peak that pushes upward at the left and disappears into mist. It's made up of repeated pointy top masses leaning dynamically sideward, but the whole thing ending inconclusively at the top. This distinctive structure cannot be paralleled anywhere in early Chinese landscape painting. Where can it be paralleled? Next, please. The answer again, which you will have guessed by now, is in another of Zhang Da Chen's signed and acknowledged works, inscribed this time as In the Manner of Dung Yuan, again. This one painted in 1947. The parallel here is so close that I said to myself when I saw it, this will surely convince them. But no, they are not to be convinced. 
they can say, since Zhang De Chen owned River Bank, it's natural that he would imitate it in his signed and acknowledged work. Hmm. Can't escape that. Okay, next. Here is the upper part of the 1947 painting, revealing the closeness of the two mountain complexes even more strikingly. In both of them, Zhang finds himself unable to finish off his dynamic structure at the top. In the 1947 signed work, he simply draws the line around it and stops. In Riverbank, he lets it disappear into mist. Next, please. <clears throat> While we're looking at the upper part of Riverbank, let me point out a few more anomalies, as I did in my symposium paper. Zhang is not at all clear about what he intends up here. There's a flight of birds seen above the river, not easily visible in this photo. We've seen similar flights in distant parts of old landscapes, all the way back to the Shoso and Biwa landscape. But here they have no far distance to fly into. The only real opening into further distance is in the far upper right. Elsewhere, uh, Zhang draws scattered trees to indicate a mountainside. So that, as I remarked in my paper, unless the birds veer sharply upward into the right, they will fly into the mountainside. But no one is supposed to see this or to make any such close observations. Next, please. Now, moving downward, we see the place where the winding river meets the shoreline and continues below as a path, with people walking on it. This also shows clearly the single small opening into sky in the far upper right. All the rest of this far distance area is dotted with little, little tree groups, as I say, as indica indications that it represents still more mountainside. Up here, Zhang seems really to be improvising, confident that just about nobody will climb up on a ladder to look carefully into the upper part of his fake. Next, please. <clears throat> Moving still further down in Riverbank, in the upper right corner of this detail, which I put on both as copied from a black and white photo and as taken from the color reproduction, uh, you can see the people on the path. Anyway, this is the part that includes the pavilion built over the water with the scholar leaning out and striking a dramatic pose with his family behind him. But before we turn to that, look at what surrounds this clearly drawn building. Try to read the shapes of the earth masses to the left of them. Absolutely unreadable, or what is presumably meant for a courtyard with roof buildings above and behind it. This is the area of which Sherman Lee wrote in the note to me that I quoted last time. Quote, the confusion in the house hyphen garden in the detail at slightly above lower left is unbelievable. Confusion everywhere, but they are supreme, end quote, right? quote. And he is, as usual, perfectly right. Confusion and disorder everywhere, no way to make visual sense out of it. Zhang simply has faked it instead of working it out clearly. Next, please. Here is a close-up of the porch of figures, and it reveals another telltale characteristic of Zhang's forgeries, which we saw earlier in the other ones, that is, he is unable to resist dramatizing his figures, making them more dynamic and self-aware looking than they would be in an early painting. Next. Zhang does the same thing in his fake Juran landscape in the British Museum. I don't have a really close-in detail, but in this picture of the lower part, you can see down here at the bottom how the scholar in the waterside pavilion leans out and turns his head as if listening, very conscious. This is another one, by the way, in which the area behind this, presumably occupied by more buildings, is confused and unreadable. Next, please. While this detail from the British Museum's fake Juron is on the screen, let me put beside it a detail from a Zhang Da Chen landscape painting that I myself own. This one on paper, which, if I remember right, is dated to 1955 and is based on a composition by Wang Meng. I bought it cheap in Hong Kong on the advice of C.C. Wong, who said, quite correctly, that I could use it for comparison with Zhang's fakes. I have indeed used it that way, especially in identifying the British Museum picture as Zhang's work. The clusters of dian, or dots, are very similar. The distinctive drawing of the bases of trees with expo exposed root structures and other features. Next. Here's the holes of the two paintings side by side. The British Museum paid a huge price for theirs. I bought mine for $150, as I recall. I had a long and contentious but friendly correspondence with Michael Sullivan about the British Museum picture. He started out defending it vigorously, then he backed away after a time to consider it 
perhaps 14th century. This is a catch-all period used also by some supporters of Riverbank who don't want to claim it as a Dungaran or as a 10th century work. At one point in our correspondence, I wrote to Michael suggesting that he stand in front of the painting and chant the following verse. The last line it is a reference to a Zhang fake in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts described to Guangdong, which by then we were all recognizing. My verse went this way. Juran, Juran on the wall, have you any age at all? Are you 14th century? Did he who made Guangdong make thee? Literary people will recognize also the William Blake echo in the last line. Michael responded with a verse of his own based on Jabberwocky. This is all recounted in my Zhang Fakes lecture on my website as CLP 16 if you want to read it. Next, please. <clears throat> Returning to Riverbank, I show a detail of the central earth masses which shows how unreadable and spongy they are. Zhang has used throughout the painting a deliberately blurry kind of brushwork, not done in clear strokes at all, but by rubbing the ink onto the silk in a way that avoids any distinctive kind of brush strokes, which he knows would give away his hand if he did it that way. This was a clever and effective move. Next, please. He does the same in some others of his forgeries. Here, for instance, are earth forms from the lower part of his large painting of trees in a wintry landscape with a traveler on a donkey accompanied by a servant, which I showed briefly and identified as Bai Zhang back when we were looking at paintings associated with Li Chung. This one is supposed to be by him, by Li Chung. Another Zhang fake, I believe. Next, please. You can see the same indistinct painting of an earth form in this close-up detail from the extreme lower left corner of Riverbank. It also reveals the stiff painting of the tree and the mechanical and repetitious filling in of the wave pattern over the whole water surface with no allowance for proximity to the shore or anything else. Next, please. I return just to remind you this telling comparison that Sherman Lee made between the water at the base of Riverbank and a section from a real 10th century painting, the Zhao Gan hand scroll. The difference is striking and revealing. Areas of water seen from a distance in some old Chinese paintings can be covered with fairly even water patterns, for instance in the Travelers in Spring ascribed to Zhang Zichen, which is in itself probably a sung copy of a Tang composition, but not when the water is in the foreground as here. I'm going to insert here a last-minute interjection inspired by looking more closely at the last two images as I reviewed this lecture. It won't be long, but it will be, I think, earth-shaking, because I believe it will put a final nail into the coffin of Riverbank, identifying it, finally and unmistakably, as a forgery by Zhang Da Chen. Going back, the first of Zhang's fakes that I looked at closely many years ago, in 1956, was the hand scroll Three Worthies of Wu Zhong that the Freer Gallery had acquired while I was away on my Fulbright year in Japan. I looked at it with, as a Zhang Da Chen fake, which by then I had come to recognize. Next. It was wrong in style for the 12th century painting it purported to be. Uh, I was already recognizing my friend Zhang Da Chen's style, his unmistakable imagery, especially in his figures. Next. But I also, in looking at the painting with our mounter Sugiyota and my teacher Shimada, came to recognize the special look of the silk on which his forgeries of early painting were done. Shimada pointed out the artificial spotting, the damage. Sugiyora made me see that the fibers of the silk were not really old and decomposing or decayed, as they should be in a painting of that purported age, but new and strong, so that the tearing of the silk must have been artificially done. Most importantly for our present purpose, this tearing or breaking of the silk had been done in a particular distinctive pattern, not over the whole surface, but only in certain places, here most strongly in the upper left part of this slide. Next. The silk had somehow been ripped, both vertically and horizontally, so as to form in some places rectangular pieces of silk. These rips are stronger and more numerous in one direction, fewer in the other, most often vertically in a hand scroll, horizontally in a ha hanging scroll, as we'll see as we look at more examples. The result is a distinctive pattern it looks a little bit like brickwork made up of rectangular patches. 
So keep this pattern in your mind's eye because we are going to see it over and over in what follows. It was not done evenly over the whole surface of the painting, but was, as I say, done only in certain places. I believe that this processing of the silk of John's would-be very old paintings was done for him in Japan, but I'm not sure of that. I can't say how it was done. Perhaps we can imagine some kind of metal object pressed down over the stretched out silk, or the silk pressed over it. That's an investigation for the future. For now, let's just observe. Next. The important point which I want to make as a clear statement here at the beginning is that this distinctive pattern can be seen on all of Zhang Dachen's forgeries of early paintings, the ones on silk, and it cannot be seen, to my knowledge, on any other old paintings. That is to say, it's distinctive in particular to Zhang Dachen forgeries. Now let me go on to demonstrate the truth of that large and startling statement. Here's a close-up detail of the would-be tongue painting of horses and grooms, loosely ascribed to Han Gan in the Musée Chernuski in Paris, a Zhang Da Chen fake that I had seen there on my travels in Europe, and another that's now generally recognized for what it is. Next. Here's a detail of the horses' heads with the telltale pattern of silt tearing, the brickwork pattern as I call it, in the upper part, and also in the lower left, also the artificial spotting. This was done so convincingly that the painting fooled for a time most of the great Chinese art specialists. Now it is, as I say, recognized by everybody as a Zhang Da Chen fake. Next. Or here's another detail, the feet of the horses, with the characteristic ripping of the silk seen clearly in the lower part. Next. I don't have original slides or photos of the now famous Bodhisattva that Wen Feng demonstrated with the fake in his article on forgeries and that I myself had initially been fooled by when I saw it in Japan. But even these images from reproductions reveal clearly the places in the silk that exhibit our now familiar pattern of vertical and horizontal tearing. Next. Once we have come to recognize it, the pattern is unmistakable. The only conclusion we can draw is that Zhang, all through his period of producing these fakes, in the early 1950s probably, used some mounter, quite likely his Tokyo mounter, Miguro Kokakudo, to process the silk in this way to give it a spurious look of great age. But it's a look entirely different from that of truly old silk, as we can easily see by looking again at details of genuinely old paintings. Next. Such as these two. A detail from the upper part of the painting ascribed to Guangtong at left, from the great Fan Quan at right, both in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. Cracking and buckling and the marks from these on hanging scrolls are, as one would expect, horizontal. Apart from uh, joins and pieces of silk, there is no reason for vertical divisions. There may be a few vertical cracks here and there, but nothing like the even, what I call the brickwork pattern, that's seen in the forgeries. Next. Or the horizontal painting of a fisherman ascribed to Ma Yuan in a Japanese collection, from which this is a detail. When I showed it, I commented that it must be a fragment cut from a large hanging scroll with strong horizontal marks where the old silk had cracked from rolling, after the silk, that is, had lost its flexibility with real age and drying out. Next. Or this Southern Song painting loosely ascribed to Ma Lin, uh, representing a buffalo and a herd boy in a landscape. The horizontal breaks, or buckling, uh, are visible from top to bottom, all horizontal. Next. Hand scrolls on silk, by contrast, since they are rolled horizontally, will of course develop vertical cracks. Here is a detail from our familiar anonymous Tang painting of the old scholar Fu Sheng, which I've shown many times. Next. Or this section from a hand scroll by Li Tang, which exhibits the uh, same expected vertical marks, where buckling or breaking has been repaired and remounting, but with the marks still visible. All this is what we would expect, and what in fact we find in all genuinely old paintings on silk, at least all of those known to me. Next, please. I'll continue to show a few more of Zhang Da Chen's fakes painted on silk to back up my claim that this distinctive and telltale pattern of ripping can be found in all of them. This hand scroll, representing Emperor Minghuang and his concubine Yang Weifei, 
was supposed to be by the Tong artist Zhang Shren and was once owned by my old friend Sheng Chi. It was one of several Zhang fakes included in Fushun's 1991 exhibition of Zhang De Chen's paintings with a symposium at which I gave a paper on these fakes. I was able to identify the source of this one when I visited one day the old villa of the recent Japanese artist Hashimoto Konsetsu in Kyoto, and I saw exhibited there, next please, a hand scroll that Hashimoto Konsetsu had painted representing four scenes in the story of Yang Weifei and Ming Huang. Zhang Jia Chen had used this, which he must have seen during his early years of studying in Kyoto, for his fake Tong painting. Next. And again, we have no trouble finding areas of the now familiar brickwork pattern uh, treatment of the silk. Zhang Da Chen's silk ager seems to have made a distinction between hand scrolls and hanging scrolls, usually, but not always, making the more dominant and continuous rips vertical in a hand scroll, horizontal in a hanging scroll. But otherwise, it's identical. It's worth noting that this aging process had to be done after the painting was done and the seals supplied. If Zhang had painted or impressed a seal over one of the breaks in the silk, that would have been a dead giveaway of fakery for obvious reasons. Next. Now finally we come to the ones that are crucial to my point, Zhang Da Chen's fakes of old landscapes. I begin with the one ascribed to Guangtong, now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, um, of which I have good slides. This is a detail from the upper part. Next. And this is the same closer in, with the unmistakable pattern. Zhang must have assumed, and he assumed correctly until a few days ago, that nobody was going to look closely enough at the silk to notice this pattern, which, once noticed, would identify as fakes beyond controversy. Next. The problem for your lecturer is that he quickly runs out of new things to say long before he has finished showing his examples. Here's another detail from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts fake Guantung. Next. And here is a closer in detail of it, exhibiting, well, exhibiting what you can see clearly before your eyes. If it's beginning to become boring, be patient. I will shortly come to our climax, toward which all this leads up. Next. In the lower part of the Boston Guantung, so-called Guantung, we see one of Zhang Da Chen's familiar images of a riverside villa with a room opening onto the water and in it one of our noble scholars, this one lying back. And we see also Zhang's bad habit of drawing the water with a repeated surface pattern that, as Sherman Lee pointed out for Riverbank, makes no allowance for swirling around the bank or anything else, but is just repeated evenly over the whole surface. Next. And here is the close-up with a pattern of artificially ripped silk, visible especially in the upper part and at right. The drawing of the architecture, the boy and the overhanging cliff are poorly done, rather beneath Zhang's uh, usual level of fake antique drawing. Next. Later I found this photograph of some of the upper part of the British Museum Juran, on which our brickwork pattern is clearly visible, so I insert it here to complete the quick survey of Zhang's fake early landscapes before we go on to the last two of them, both of them in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Next. Our next to last Zhang Da Chen forgery, the big painting supposed to be by Li Chung in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, was shown before, and I show it again with a new detail of branches of twigs from one of the trees uh, seen in the upper left, exhibiting very clearly in a few places the pattern that by now most of you will be tired of seeing but I'm not yet quite tired of showing it to you. And next, please. The figure of the donkey rider below, with our brickwork pattern seen in the lower, lower part. How well I remember being chastised at a symposium for raising a question about the age and authenticity of this by one of Wen Fong's, or rather, I guess it was Dick Barnhart's pupils. I hope that the clear visual proof that I'm giving will put to an end that kind of trying to stifle dissension. Next, please. These final two paintings, the Li Chung and Riverbank, uh, can conveniently be seen and compared in a single place, that is the storage room, I hope they're not on exhibition, 
of the Metropolitan Museum, convenient for future researchers who will only confirm what we're seeing here in slides. Next, please. And so we return at last, surprise, to Riverbank. This is an image of it made by the Met shortly before the symposium, showing the areas of the painting that were added as patches, the white spots on the image. The rest in brown of the picture on it is the purported original. I put this one on screen to make one important preliminary point. If anyone tries to tell you that the images I'm going to show belong to patches or additions to the painting, don't believe them. That's absolutely untrue. They are on the main areas. And the images I'll show, I have no original sides of Riverbank, unfortunately. The images are made from original 8 by 10 inch black and white photographs made by the Metropolitan's photographers, presumably, and sent to me, and I assume to other participants, before the 1999 symposium for use in our papers. Next. One of these good original 8x10 photos from which this image is made shows the whole upper half of the painting. I've talked enough in the earlier part of this lecture about why what you see is impossible stylistically is a truly old painting. Now we're looking for only one thing next. The damning brickwork pattern. And in fact, when we look hard, we find patches of it here and there on the painting. Next. There will be some out there who are, for whatever reason, committed to a belief in the antiquity and importance of Riverbank who don't want to see what we are about to see. Next. But I am equally committed to getting the truth out. And the truth is that Riverbank exhibits at many points the clear signs of being a Zhang Da Chen forgery. Next. It may be that with more work, one could make that kind of diagram of, of what I call the brickwork pattern and superimpose it on the photos and make it match up on different forgeries. I'm not attempting anything like that. Only pointing out what is very clear visually, the same pattern that we've seen on other Zhang Da Chen fakes seen now on several parts of Riverbank. With enough original photos and time, I could show it on quite a few more spots, but these will surely suffice to prove my point for anyone with open eyes and open mind. Next. The central area of the painting, showing the riverside structure, the people in it, and the visually incoherent surroundings, which Herman Lee talked about in his brief talk. Next. The upper left part, the edge of the overhanging bank, with an especially clear example of the brickwork pattern. Let me repeat, these are not to be seen only on the patches of new silk laid in to repair holes in the painting, but are to be seen you know, on the main areas of the painting as well. No way out. Next. And a detail of the water with the familiar pattern stretching across the center of it. The actual age of the silk, which I discussed with Bob Mowry, as recounted earlier in this lecture, is a separate issue. I should add here that some defender of Riverbank may try to claim that this tearing of the silk was done during a remounting and isn't part of the original painting. Uh, and Riverbank was indeed remounted by Megodo in Tokyo while the painting was owned by C.C. Wong. But this is totally impossible. No mounter remounting an old painting would introduce these paintings of small rips all over the surface. They definitely belong to the original, the original fake, that is, uh, as aged by Zhang's workers in the first place. Next, please. The lower left corner, which we're looking at for a different reason before I begin this digression. The would-be signature along the left edge is on separate silk, and even the strongest defenders of the painting acknowledge that it's probably a later edition. It doesn't, but that doesn't concern us now, nor does the, nor do the seals, obvious new ones of Zhang Da, Zhang da Chen himself, and would be ancient ones dimmer behind them. Next. Not ideally clear, but I hope visible in this closure in detail, the brickwork pattern used here as elsewhere unevenly. It isn't spread evenly over the large area. Future research may well reveal how it was accomplished. There may even be a survivor or two in Japan who took part in it and who might be located and persuaded to tell his story. Next. Finally, for Riverbank, a really close in detail from, the, from this lower left corner, the earth bank with grasses, 
and our brickwork pattern, which you must by now be tired of looking at, and I'm tired of talking about. But the very repetitiousness of our images and of my talking about them is the very point, and is the basis on which I can now say, I hope without any doubters out there, Riverbank is clearly, visibly, unmistakably one of Zhang Da Chen's forgeries. It should be removed forever from the body of genuinely old Chinese landscape paintings and credited to its real author, next please, its real author, Zhang Da Chen, seen here in a professional photograph made during his stay in California near Carmel. Here he's seen seated on a log from one of the great famous Monterey cypress trees for which that region is famous. Congratulations again, old friend, on fooling so many of us for so long. Next. But I want to express my hope that another younger old friend, Maxwell or Mike Hearn, chair, chairman of the Asiatic Art Department of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, won't be too much disturbed by these new revelations. Mike Hearn is a fine scholar and a good guy in all respects, and I'll be sorry if the identification of Riverbank as a Zhang Da Chen fake against the arguments that he's made in all honesty, according to his real belief in its antiquity, if these cause him any great distress. Sorry, Mike, I had to do it. And so back to our main addendum. Next, please. Just as I was about to close this and prepare to record it as one of my series, one of my former students sent me an excerpt from a Chinese blogger's writing on the web, which concerns me. I asked her to do a rough translation with the result you see on the screen. This blogger may be a Chinese student. I have no idea who he or she is. This blogger writes with some very complimentary things about me and goes on to complain about the Riverbank affair. How could all the Chinese participants in that affair have missed seeing the things wrong with Riverbank, while a single foreigner named Gao Ju Han, that's myself, got it right? The Chinese blogger writes in this translation, quote, I feel deeply ashamed, and adds, do not take for granted that being Chinese would take you to the understanding of Chinese culture. Well, well, thank you, Chinese blogger, for those much appreciated sentiments. I hope that you represent the future of riverbank studies in which it will come to be universally recognized as a Zhang Da Chen fake, in the same way that the Supper of Emmaus is now recognized as a fake by von Meheren. Forgeries that I've observed several times seem to have a limited life. For a while they fool lots of people, but eventually they fool nobody. But while I thank the Chinese blogger, I also want to correct him or her on a really important matter and end this way. In this particular instance, because of the weak point in tra traditional Chinese connoisseurship that I've spoken of several times, uh, its inability to deal effectively with early paintings that don't exhibit the individual style and brushwork on which it depends for its judgments. Because of this, the Chinese scholars who were involved in the River Mag affair did indeed go wrong. Next. But there were also Chinese specialist scholars who didn't believe in Riverbank, but who didn't come out openly with that opinion, so as not to embarrass C.C. C. Wong and other supporters of the painting. One of these, I have reason to believe, was the great Chinese connoisseur Xu Bang Da, seen here in a photo with me and two others, taken on a study trip in Anhui. Chinese scholars, that is, were not by any means unanimous in supporting Riverbank, but it was only the supporters who went public, attended the Authenticity Symposium, and were vocal about it. Next, please. <coughs> also, let's not forget that it was another Chinese scholar, who was also a distinguished artist and a master forger, that is, Zhang Da Chen himself, who created Riverbank. And most importantly, I want to conclude by making this point as strongly as I can, I could go on with another long lecture giving examples of where, especially for the later periods of Chinese painting, traditional Chinese connoisseurship has proven to be right on and to have taught us foreigners a lot of things we didn't know and needed to know. The next, please. As I related my fur metal talk, I wasn't confident enough during my Fulbright year to buy my first major Chinese painting, The Fisherman Hand Scroll by Wu Wei, for about $150, haha, <laughs> until I had brought Zhang Da Chen, who fortunately was in Tokyo at the time, to look at it with me. He okayed the purchase, and he explained some intrusive brushwork in it as additions made when two separate sections of it had been joined, 
and some inpainting had to be done to disguise the join. This is only one single instance of many in which I learned from Zhang Da Chen. Next, please. As for C. C. Wong, I was completely sincere in showing him and crediting him at the beginning of this series as one of my three great teachers. And I can say that for connoisseurship, he was the greatest. Neither Lur nor Shimano was in the same class for that. Their strengths were elsewhere. The hours and days that I spent looking at paintings of C.C. Wong and listening to him talk were fundamental to whatever competence I attained in recognizing Chinese painting styles and artists. I would show him a hand scroll in the Freer Gallery that had been bought as a work by Xu Ban of the late Yuan and ask him what it, what it was, and he would tell me that it really was a work by Lu Yuan of the early Qing. And I would check and find a Lu Yuan painting and compare it and find that he was correct. That went on over and over. Things of this kind happened over and over. Uh, next, please. The same is true of Li Lin San, seen here second from the left, and Zhuang Lian, then the director of the Palace Museum, seen here in the center. I learned a lot from both of them during that crucial learning period of my career. Next. If I can now show this painting and discuss it as a work by the Jin Dynasty artist Wu Yuan Zhe, it's because Zhuang Nian identified it as that through his research in Chinese texts, matching it up with a recorded work. But he was also very strong in visual connoisseurship, and I benefited a great deal from looking at paintings with him, too. Next, please. If I can put on this lovely fan painting by Ma Lin and speak of it as a picture of a man who has candles lit in his garden and sits up late to gaze at the flowering trees, afraid that their blossoms will drop while he is asleep, if I can speak of it that way, it's because Li Lin San correctly identified the subject from a poem by Su Dung Po, where it had been wrongly identified before. Next, please. Another example is the wonderful figure painting by some southern Sun court artist for which Li Lin San proposed the alternative to the traditional account of his subject, the Han Emperor, who, because his old father is too weak to visit his home village once more, has the whole village and all its residents transported to just outside the palace. And he's seen here taking the old father out to see it. Whichever reading is right, Li Lin San's version, based on his knowledge of Chinese texts of a kind that we mostly don't have, deepens our reading of the painting. Next, please. If, in speaking about this famous painting, I point out the drawing in nail head, rat tail lines, and I suggest a dating in the early song for the copy, I'm quoting the research of Li Lin San, he did that for many paintings, famous paintings in the Palace Museum collection. He was the one who discovered the signature on the Fan Quan masterwork. Nobody had seen it up to that time. Next, please. If I begin talking about C.C. C. Wong's contribution to the study and collecting of Chinese paintings, especially in the U.S., I could go on for hours. If all the paintings in U.S. museums and private collections that were bought either from him or from people he advised, such as C.T. Liu and Walter Hochstetter, if all these were to disappear, our collections would be sorely depleted, with many of our finest holdings gone. Next, please. When I show, as I did, this fine work by Zhao Lingrong and discuss it, it's because C.C. Wong introduced it and sold it to the Metropolitan Museum in one of the several group purchases they made from him. Wen Fong, who was responsible for these, got a lot of criticism for them, but look back on now, they were mostly wise acquisitions of paintings very much worth having. Next, please. And the same promised gift from Oscar Tang that includes Riverbank also includes such fine works as this palace picture that I discussed at length in Lecture 5, depending heavily on Mike Hearn's study of it. It hasn't been possible to acknowledge my indebtedness to the research and connoisseurship of others at every point in these lectures, but I've tried to do it whenever I can, and I apologize for not doing it more. Next, please. <clears throat> When I use this fine painting of Arhats, which I believe to be a genuine work by Fan Lung, an important link between literati painting and Chan painting, it's because I saw it first in the collection of C.C. C. Wong and persuaded the Freer to purchase it from him. Next, please. And finally, when I talk in Lecture 4b about how the Ming artist Dum Chi Chong learned some of his style from a painting he accepted as the work of Wang Wei, I use this Dum Chi Chong work in the manner of Wang Wei which was owned by C.C. Wong. It's an exception. And I used, throughout all my writings and study, I used Wong's paintings over and over and over again. 
I could go on for hours, but I must stop. I think I've made my point. I appreciate very much your words of praise, Chinese blogger, but I have to correct you on this point. You may, you may feel deeply ashamed because the Chinese scholars involved in the Riverbank affair were, you and I feel, in the wrong. But that could be balanced or overbalanced by countless examples in which they were in the right and we were wrong <coughs> or in need of their teaching. So if all the young Chinese specialists with their particular strengths and all the young foreign specialists with their particular strengths will work together in a spirit of bipartisanship, I'm writing this on January 26, the morning after Obama's notable State of the Union speech, if both sides acknowledge the strengths of the others and their own weak points, we will make great progress in solving all the problems that the study of Chinese painting confronts us with. And that really is the end of this long addendum and the proper ending of this whole series. The end. Signed, James Cahill.